Hey everyone and welcome back to the Marshall Variety channel. It is me, Jay, back again with a solo video and I'm going to do part two of my book video today. This is going to be the video where I talk about the books I did read and review them in a little bit more depth. So the structure of this is going to be, I'll show you the book, I'll read the blurb to you to give you a general idea, I'll tell you what I thought, give you my star rating one more time and uh, if I mark the book for really good quotes I'll perhaps throw a quote in there and I'll just give you my criticisms. There will be spoilers for some of them and I'll let you know when that is so if you don't want to be spoiled then obviously you can skip forward to the next book that kind of thing but firstly you notice anything different about me i wonder if you can notice of course it's the pink hair everybody what do you think ma'am it is gorgeous isn't it i love it so much i always feel like my true self when i got pink hair obviously you guys don't know i've had pink hair before and i absolutely loved it but after it washed out i just let it grow so long and i just went so long without just ringing in or uh, organising an appointment. Because you know what it's like, you say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, and then you never do it, and then you actually do it. And this is the result. Of course, it looked a lot better on the day, but I ain't no hairdresser, so uh, <laughs> this is about the best I can do with it. So yeah, let's get started. So the first book we're gonna talk about is the first book we spoke about in the first video as well, which is Animal Farm by George Orwell. So this is one where I'm not really gonna read you a quote because the bits I marked were more plot-centered and I really liked that bit rather than that quote. But um, this is the blurb. So Mr. Jones of Manor Farm is so lazy and drunken that one day he forgets to feed his livestock. The ensuing rebellion under the leadership of the pigs Napoleon and Snowball leads to the animals taking over the farm. Vowing to eliminate the terrible inequalities of the farmyard, the renamed Animal Farm is organised to benefit all who walk on four legs. But as time passes, the ideals of the rebellion are corrupted, then forgotten, and something new and unexpected emerges. So that's actually a really, really great way of uh, describing the entire book. Like, I don't even know where else I could really say. Yeah, it's, it's actually excellent. It's, yeah, it's under 100 pages as well. It's over like that. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a classic. Uh, I thought this was really, really interesting. And I thought it was awesome how it paralleled like dictatorships from humans to animals and how it could so easily happen. Obviously, this is, you know, satire. It's animals. But I really liked how it, how it translated that across. I thought it was really, really interesting. And um, the very last line of the book is like amazing like obviously i'm not going to read it because huge spoilers but uh kind of cements the whole thing into place so i only gave this one three and a half stars which is still a really great rating like i consider anything above three stars to be really good but um the reason why is that uh character wise it was lacking it wasn't really about that but i still like there to be some sort of relatable character in a book that i can really enjoy this wasn't really like that and the plot was meandering throughout the book it wasn't a very plot driven thing so you know you you did have to really enjoy the nuance of it and like what was behind the scenes like what, what it really meant to really get the book but i did think it was a really good one and i do recommend it if you like classics it's not hard to read it's not written in a really weird confusing way anything like that so yeah that is animal farm so continuing in the same vein the next is the george orwell book 1984 so this is a classic everybody knows about this one and um, this was one i also gave a good rating i gave this one four stars actually and um, I think I might read a quote for this one. Let's have a look, shall we? Okay, so I found a really good quote from the book. So here is one. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. If that is granted, all else follows. So this is quite a really interesting book. It's a dystopian book, so it's... Uh, it's set in a different world, but it's still like real people. So this is the blurb. So Winston Smith works for the Ministry of Truth in London, chief city of A-Strip 1. Big Brother stays out from every poster. The Thought Police uncover every act of betrayal. When Winston finds love with Julia, he discovers that life does not have to be dull and deadening and awakens to new possibilities. Despite the police helicopters that hover and circle overhead, Winston and Julia begin to question the party and they are drawn towards conspiracy. Yet Big Brother will not tolerate dissent, even in the mind. For those with original thoughts, they invented Room 101. So there's a lot to talk about with this book. So obviously they couldn't blurb it like completely fully, but uh, that's the basic gist of it. And the reason I gave this four stars is that there is a part towards the end of the book. So this is going to be a spoiler. Skip this part if you don't want to know about the book, if you want to read it. But uh, Winston and Julia... We get given the textbook for the uprising and there's a whole like 50 page section of the book where it is literally just the textbook and like three chapters 
and just written fully, like, all the thought processes of who want to uprise against Big Brother. And it's the most boring, most meandering thing I've ever read in my entire life. Like, the first two pages, I was like, yeah, this is okay. And then it just went, Phew, and I was just like, I can't with this. I was actually skim reading, skipping the pages. And that, and it really sucked because it broke up the pacing towards the end of the book because it was so good for the first, like, 270 pages and it died. And then the ending was awesome, which obviously I'm not going to talk about. But, uh, yeah, that's the main reason why I demoted a whole star, because it was a huge chunk of the book that I found extremely boring. But other than that, I thought this was an excellent book. I thought the characters were interesting. They weren't, like, people you loved, for, for, for example, but they were really interesting perspectives to read from. And I do recommend this one, especially people who like dystopia. It's definitely a really good dystopia. Okay, so next, ooh, where should we go? We'll go for The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. So like we said in the first video, everybody knows this one. And this is one I think you should read. Before I even say anything, you should read this one. This is really, really good. So let's search for a quote. Okay, so the quote I'm going to give you from this one is from right at the beginning of the book. And this is, I've seen it happen over and over again. A black person gets killed for being black and all hell breaks loose. I tweeted RIP hashtags, we blogged pictures on Tumblr and signed every petition out there. I always said that if I saw it happen to somebody, I would have the loudest voice, making sure the world knew what went down. But now that I am that person, I'm too afraid to speak. So I think that uh, very well sums up what this is about. Um, so this is the blurb. Star lives in two worlds, the poor neighbourhood where she was born and raised and her posh high school in the suburbs. The uneasy balance between them is shattered when Star is the only witness to the fatal shooting of her unarmed best friend Khalil by a police officer. Now what Star says could destroy her community, but it could also get her killed. That sounds bad. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing this is. Gotta read this one, you've just gotta. Uh, I think that, like I said before, they should teach this in schools. This is such an important book. Police brutality is still such an important thing, a really relevant thing that still happens to this day, still boggles my mind. But um, this is such a real portrayal. It doesn't sugarcoat the situation. It gives you too, it gives you too real. It doesn't try and make it all fancy with the way it's written. It is dead real, exactly how it happens. And um, I think it's so much better for that. It also discusses some really interesting other things as well because she's from a poorer neighborhood where there's a lot more violence and gang shootings, that kind of thing. How that contrasts to her life in school. And she acts differently in school to try and fit in with um, the mostly white population there. And how her family deals with the fact she has a white boyfriend. There's just so many really interesting things going on in this. It is such a gut punch. It's so powerful. There are loads of points where you're just like, oh my God, like it just hits you with a gut punch. And it's just so, so good. And this was a five stars. I... I suppose if I had to critique something, I would say that um, the plot goes a bit up and down. There are bits, there are sections where nothing happens, but you're still really enjoying the characters, so it doesn't really matter. And yeah, so that's The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Highly recommend. So continuing on the theme of violence involving black teens, we're going to go with Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. So this was one I was um, a bit scared to talk about in my first video because I only gave it three stars and everyone was giving it five stars. But I had to share my opinion on it. I just didn't like the way it was written. I'll say that straight away. I gave this three stars. It is written in verse, which was ultimately the reason why I didn't enjoy it as much. I feel like if it had been a short story, for example, and expanded a little bit to like 100, 150 pages, I think this would have been amazing. It would have been something that could have easily reread over and over and over again because it's so powerful and it has such an important message but um the way it is i'm still a little bit like mm. again there's not there's no like bit i can pick out for you because the whole thing is a cohesive narrative even if it is written in verse so this is the uh, blurb of the book if someone you love gets killed find the person who killed them and killed them no crying no snitching get revenge those are the rules so uh the way it's set up in this is that the main character that's the they've that's um, the, the way the whole community works. Like, if your family member gets shot by someone in that gang violence, you do the same thing. But um, the, the kind of thing this is trying to get at is that that's just a never-ending cycle of violence and death, and it ne doesn't really get you anywhere. But the characters um, don't necessarily realise that. And um, it basically revolves around the main character's brother gets killed, he gets shot, and um, he goes to kill the person who killed his brother, and he gets into the elevator, and as it's going down different floors, different people from his life who he's known who have also been killed by gunshots in gang violence start talking to him about what happened to them, and uh, that's all I'm going to say. It's really, really interesting, this one. I do recommend it, I think, especially if you can really, really look deep into it and really take your time reading through um, each page because it's a poem. But um, if you're not into that kind of thing, if you want it to be more explained, then maybe give this one a skip. 
So next is one I can definitely read a quote for because the uh, writing in this book is amazing. So this is The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. Now, I absolutely love this one. This one is so, so good. So I'm gonna read the blurb for you. The circus arrives without warning. No announcements precede it. It is simply there when yesterday it was not. So it's very, very vague because there is a hell of a lot to this book. It's very, very complicated, but it is fantastic. I absolutely love this one. The way this was written, some of the most stunning writing ever. It's not hard to understand or anything like that, but it is really descriptive. So if you don't like descriptive writing, I definitely don't think you should go for this because uh, it's quite a slow build up and it just, and it all comes together so well. It's mind blowing how good this one was. And I did really, really like it. So there is an expansion to the blurb as well on Amazon, which I will read to you because it's not spoilery or anything. As the sun disappears over the horizon, all over the tent, small lights begin to flicker, as through the entirety of the circus is covered in particularly bright fireflies. When the tents are all aglow, sparkling against the night sky, the sign appears, the circus of dreams. Now the circus is open and you may enter. This is another way to uh, talk about how whimsical the book is. But um, this has absolutely amazing characters, very, very interesting characters. And what I think is really interesting about it um, is that they kind of make the circus itself a character, which is what's really, really, really interesting. And the way it's told is so, so different. It's awesome. So let's find you all a quote to demonstrate how good the writing is. Then there is a pause. For just a moment, time slows like something falling while fighting with gravity. The chill breeze that has circled through the open path of the circus stops. In the moment, nothing flutters, not the fabric of the tents, nor the ribbon ties of dozens of masks. In the tallest tent, one of the acrobats loses her perfect balance, falling some distance before one of her fellow performers catches her, only narrowing a void and crashing to the ground. As you can see, it's quite descriptive and it's really, really well woven together. And um, another tidbit I can give you about the book, because it's described in like the first chapter, is what it's basically about is two uh, top magicians sort of breed their own apprentices who are going to duel to the death in the night circus, as it were. And that's all I'm gonna say, because this is the kind of book that I don't even wanna spoil because it's so good, you need to read it for yourself. I gave this one five stars. I didn't really have anything bad to say about it other than what I said at the beginning. It's slow, it's a builder, but it is so worth the build up. I thought when I was going through, mm, this is only like four stars, and I got to the end, and I was like, five stars immediately. So yeah, highly recommend. So next is The Martian by Andy Weir. So straight away, if you're not into some heavy sci-fi, don't even bother. Film was shit. You didn't like the film, did you? I hated it, Jason loved it. I think I probably like it because I loved the book, but um, I don't know. Because what I- was the other one? What was the other one with Gravity. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> and it won so many awards. It was massive, I Yeah, it won like best cinematography and that, didn't it? Well, Sorry. that's what this is. He's just oh, on. He's just on Mars the entire the entire book. I hated that. You know me. Yeah, you hate anything where it's just in one place, you know. <laughs> but anyway, The Martian. So uh, I went into this a little bit skeptical because I was like, I haven't actually read a sci-fi book before. I don't know how I'm gonna feel. I'm probably not gonna like it. And then I ended up giving it five stars and absolutely loving it. So yeah, really? yeah. So never listen to you. Never listen to that when it's about books because you can never judge it by the cover. You can never judge it by the genre either. I actually thought this was awesome. Now, something that I did really appreciate about this is how scientific and how mathematical it was. That definitely played a part into why I liked it so much because, um, you know, the main character is a scientist. So he talks about everything in a very scientific, analytical way, but still understandable at the same time, which is really, really cool. So here is the blurb. I'm stranded on Mars. I have no way to communicate with Earth. If the oxygenator breaks down, I'll suffocate to death. If the water reclaimer breaks down, I'll die of thirst. If the habitat breaches, I'll just kind of explode. If none of those things happen, I'll eventually run out of food and starve to death. I'm screwed. So yeah, I think that's all I really need to say about the book because that is the whole thing. But um, the, the determination of the main character is so inspiring. And um, it would have been lower stars if they didn't include the jumping back and forth between NASA trying to save him then his perspective, then NASA trying to save him. That was what really made the book as good as it was for me. And I did think the last chapter was absolutely incredible, like made the book a five stars for me. So if you like sci-fi or if you want to give sci-fi a go, I definitely think this is a good gateway into it, but I will show you one later, which is even better. So next is Simon vs. Homo Sapiens Agenda, or if you've seen the film Love, Simon, this is the book that it's based on. And uh, I did also really enjoy this one. I give the Martian five stars, like I told you all before, but this was a, ooh, what do you want? Drink, drink. Yeah, but what do you want? Sorry, 
guys, just have a drink. Making me cat, how dare you. So I gave this one four stars. So I didn't really have a problem with it per se. I just didn't think it was incredible five stars immediately. You know what I mean? I really enjoyed the characters. I thought it was a really relatable story. Um, I definitely could relate to it having um, gone through the, you know, in the closet in high school kind of thing. You know, I think a lot of people can relate to this. But I didn't think it was like, it's so fluffy and um, so cute. But at the same time, it's not like mind blowing. Like, oh, this really taught me something. I really learned a lesson kind of thing. And sometimes I do need that from a book if it's not going to give me much else. Do you know what I mean? I do want to read the other books from some of the other characters' perspectives. I do think they would be really interesting. So here is the blurb. Simon Spear is 16 and trying to work out who he is and what he's looking for. But when one of his emails to the very distracting Blue falls into the wrong hands, things get all kinds of complicated because for Simon, falling for Blue is a pretty big deal. So the basic gist is that the main character, Simon, is... Um, emailing anonymously with uh, a guy called Blue and um, they're just trying to figure out their sexuality, talk to each other, that kind of thing. And uh, one, of the, one of the characters right at the beginning discovers the emails and blackmails him. So that's all we're gonna say about that. I do think everybody should read this one if you're into LGBT fiction. This is definitely a really good one to start with. It's not the best one you're gonna read. I'll mention a better one later, but um, it is a really, really good one. It's by Becky Albatali. The Martian was by Andy Weir. So next, well, speaking of the LGBT book, Call Me By Your Name. So I actually thought this one was better than that one. So here is the blurb for Call Me By Your Name. A lot of you would have seen the film most likely because the film is really popular. I haven't seen that one either, which is scandalous because I love the book so much. But uh, once I do watch the films for some of these, I will let you know what I think. Perhaps I'll do like uh, comparing the book to the adaptation kind of video. What's it called? Call Me By Your Name. It's the one I told you about before with the peach, remember? It's that one. The film almost won, won Best Picture. And they do that in it. At the Oscars. And it's in the film too. They didn't, cut, they didn't cut it out. But I think it's because the film is so moving that they don't care that it's really smutty. Do you know what I mean? That, that's why I love this because it was so moving. It was really, really good. During a relentless... Ooh, I was going to say relentless. During a restless summer on the Italian Riviera, a powerful romance blooms between 17-year-old Elio and his father's house guest, Oliver. Unrelenting currents of obsession and fear, fascination and desire threaten to overwhelm the lovers who at first feign indifference to the charge between them. What grows from the depths of their souls is a romance of scarcely six weeks duration and an experience that marks them for a lifetime. For what the two discover on the Riviera and during a sultry evening in Rome is the one thing they both already fear they may never truly find again, total intimacy. So I think that's actually an excellent blurb. Like that really, really well describes it because that is the whole thing. One of the reasons I love this so much is that it's written in kind of the way that I think. So I'm a really overly analytical person. I overthink everything. I think my mom can attest to that. Sure. And this is written like that. It's just lots of thoughts, lots of things. Like it, it doesn't, it flows, but um, it's, there's just a lot going on because the main character is only 17 and he is overthinking everything because he's, you know, falling for this guy and... He doesn't know if he likes him back, that kind of thing's a lot going on here. But of course the romance blooms as it says on the back. So that's not a spoiler. I do think everybody should read this one, but I am gonna spoil, uh, spoiler, but I am gonna warn plenty of smut, especially after this second half. Like you may get to one particular bit where you're gonna be like, oh, like a scandal, like you're gonna be shook, mm -hmm. right? Cause I was reading it and I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> and I, I th I I remember I remember ringing, ringing my mother to tell her I was like you will not believe what I just read oh my god I'm so shook yeah it, but yeah you're gonna be shook but um it's worth it like this the smut the smut adds to the story to be honest like it's not just there for no reason like it is really really good and it's actually really moving like the whole last section of the book the last like sixty pages really moved me and I was like oh my god this is so good and this is by Andre Ackerman I give this five stars highly highly recommend if you're into any LGBT fiction get this one this is definitely one you need to read. Also, if you guys have any other LGBT fiction books that you can recommend me in the comments, I don't care what kind of romance it is, if it's female, female, male, female, if it's trans, non-binary, anything like that, I want to read anything from those kinds of perspectives, so just put them in the comments and let me know. So next, where are we going to go? I think we'll go to Elno Oliphant is Completely Fine. So, as you all know from the first video, one of the best books I've ever read, when I picked this up, it was, um, it was on offer, it was, for like three or four pound, I think it was. And I, it was the um, book of the month 
and it was the Costa Book Award winner of 2017. So I was like, oh, this sounds awesome. And as you'll find out whenever you do the blurb, it's quite, bl it's quite, um, how would you say it? Quite vague. Eleanor Oliver leads a simple life. She wears the same clothes to work every day, eats the same meal deal for lunch every day, and buys the same two bottles of vodka to drink Holy every bitch. weekend. Huh? That's for sure. <laughs> Eleanor Oliver is happy. Nothing is missing from her carefully timetabled life, except sometimes everything. So that is uh, a very, very vague way to describe this, but I don't, I think you should go into this one not knowing a lot because once it opens up about 40 or 50 pages in, then you just get, you're just like hit so hard by it. And this is a really, really moving one. This one will, will shake you to your core. Like it is amazing, amazing, amazing. But there are trigger warnings for abuse, a lot of that. So uh, if you don't want to read about that kind of thing, if that's going to really upset you or, or if it's going to trigger you about from past experience, don't read this, definitely don't. But um, let's find you all a quote because I thought the writing in this one, the Night Circus's writing was amazing, really descriptive, but I think the actual quality of the writing is the best out of all the books I'm going to talk about today. So let's find you all a quote. Okay, so as much as I want to read you some of the incredible quotes and gut punches from the second half of the book, I'd rather not do that. This is not a book I feel any need to spoil whatsoever because it is so, so good. So I'm just going to give you one from the beginning of the book. So... I feel sorry for beautiful people. Beauty, from the moment you possess it, is already slipping away. Ephemeral. That must be difficult. Always having to prove that there's more to you. Wanting people to see beneath the surface. To be loved for yourself and not your stunning body, sparkling eyes or thick, lustrous hair. So that's one of the many insights that the main character of this, Eleanor Oliphant, gives. And a uh, very interesting thing I want to say about this is that the first 30 pages were a drag. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to hate this. Because I actually despised Eleanor for the first 30 pages. I thought she was a judgmental, snooty bitch, to be honest with you all. But um, as soon as we really got to know her and not just saw how she acted on the surface, I just, I fell in love with how quirky she was. I thought she was incredible. I loved all the other characters as well. I thought Raymond was amazing. I loved Raymond's mother. There were some absolutely incredible characters in this and um, some incredible gut punches as well. Uh, for those who have read the book, I'm going to say the chapter's beginning, Bad Days. That chapter is, oh my God, one of the best chapters I've ever read in my entire life. Crazy, crazy good. So I definitely highly recommend this to everybody, but this is more on the adult side of things. Uh, I wouldn't particularly read this if you were looking for something light, something young, definitely not. But I did give it five stars because it was bloody brilliant. And it's by Gail Honeyman. So next is the book I read most recently, and that is A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab or Victoria Schwab, whatever you want to say. So this is the first in a fantasy trilogy. The blurb is this. Kel is one of the last travellers, magicians with a rare ability to travel between parallel universes connected by one magical city. There's Grey London, without magic and ruled by a mad king, Red London, where magic is revered and where Kel was raised, White London, where people fight to control the magic and the magic fights back, and once there was Black London, disappeared. So that actually gives a really interesting uh, kind of frame to the whole thing. So this is about parallel Londons and... Um, Seeing them is, they're so vividly described in this. But what I really like about the way Victoria Schwab writes in this is that it's not too descriptive, but it also isn't over, it isn't under described either, kind of in the middle. And it's described enough, you know, the dialogue has a lot of weight to it. She doesn't like use a thousand words to say one thing, because sometimes that can actually be really beautiful, but she just, she hits you hard with the words. And that's what I really, really like. I tabbed a lot in this. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to find a quote, but I am gonna have a quick look in a minute. A lot of what I tabbed was um, the concepts that she had going on so that I could flip back and so I wouldn't forget and so everything would make sense. Cause I wanted to make sure there were no plot holes cause uh, no one could deal with a plot hole. But spoiler alert, I gave it five stars. Absolutely loved it. The next book I'm going to read is the second one. I still haven't started it yet because I've been uh, figuring out some other things for YouTube, which I will give an update on soon. So yes. Now here's a lovely bit of description from the book. Even at night, the river shone red. As Kel stepped from the bank of one London onto the bank of another, the black slick of the Thames was replaced by the warm, steady glow of the isle. It glittered like a jewel, lit from within, a ribbon of constant light unraveling through red London, a source, a vein of power, an artery. Some thought magic came from the mind, others the soul, or the heart, or the will. But Kel knew it came from the blood. Blood was magic made manifest, there it thrived and there it poisoned. Kel had seen what had happened when power warred through the body, watched it darken in the veins of corrupted men, turning their blood from crimson to black. If red was the colour of magic in balance, of harmony between power and humanity, then black was the colour of magic without balance, without order, without restraint. 
there's just a little sample of the way uh, things are described and the way things are laid out to you. It's so clear cut and it's so, it's just, it's just beautiful. I don't really know how else to describe it. It's just fantastic. And I'm really excited to read book two. And uh, hopefully I will get to that soon. Of course, this is all the books I've read recently. So I need to start reading more because otherwise I've got no uptake videos for you all. So uh, keep pressuring me in the comments to read more. But yes, five stars. So returning to sci-fi for a little bit, we've got Illumine by Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff. So I uh, didn't tab anything on this one because uh, of the way it was written. It's kind of hard to really tab with this kind of thing. So uh, before I talk about the book itself and its structure, let's go into the blurb. So the year is 2575 and two mega corporations are at war over a planet that's little more than an ice covered speck. Too bad nobody thought to warn the people living on it. With enemy fire raining down on them, Ezra and Katie have to make their escape on the evacuating fleet. But their troubles are only just beginning. A deadly plague has broken out on one of the spaceships and it is mutating with terrifying results. Their ship's protection is seriously flawed and no one will say what is going on. As Katie hacks into a tangled web of data to find the truth, it's clear only one person can help her, Ezra. And the only problem with that is that they split up before all the trouble started and she isn't supposed to be talking to him so yeah there's a hell of a lot going on in this one but uh, this is such an interesting book and it's actually a trilogy and I do need to pick up the other two because I love this one so much five stars already gonna tell you this is written in what's called multimedia so we, we have interviews we've got emails between characters we've got uh, excerpts from AIs it's just so so interesting I'm gonna give you a quick example so Here's a page where we're doing some interviews. Here's some um, reports from the commanding officers. Here's some of the AI chapters. There's just a hell of a lot going on. And it is, and it is like you are literally reading through files and it is called the Illuminate Files. And this is one, if you wanna try any form of sci-fi, gotta do this one. This one is so fast paced, it's so intense, it's, it can be quite scary to be honest at points like it's really really intense like you're on the edge of your seat from almost the second you open the book and that's what I absolutely love so I live and die for and uh, this was when I polished off into sit-ins like I read like 100 pages the first time and then all 500 the rest of them in the second sitting because it was just so addictive but um, one thing I will say I didn't demote any points for it but it is a problem and if you do dislike this then uh, don't read it but it has this it has like a plot convenience thing with the characters where like they shouldn't have survived that but they did like that kind of thing I'm I'm not going to say if that's towards the end of the book or anything it's not a spoiler but um it does it does come across as <laughs> this is so stupid me saying this comes across as unrealistic when this is set in space and uh, is all the future but you know it still is a little bit too contrived at points but other than that excellent book so we're coming towards the end we've only got three more books so I'll keep that one for last, I think. So next we'll do The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue by Mackenzie Lee. So uh, this is a hardback, so I'll give you the nice blurb from the inside. Henry Monty Montague was born and bred to be a gentleman, but he was never one to be tamed. The finest boarding schools in England and the constant disapproval of his father haven't been able to curb any of his roguish passions, not for gambling halls, late nights spent with a bottle of spirits, or waking up in the arms of women or men. But as Monty embarks on his grand tour of Europe, his quest for a life filled with pleasure and vice is in danger of coming to an end. Not only does his father expect him to take over the family's estate upon his return, but Monty is also nursing an incredible crush on his best friend and travelling companion, Percy. Still, it isn't in Monty's nature to give up, even with his younger sister Felicity in tow, he vows to make this year-long escapade one long hedonistic hurrah and flirt with Percy from Paris to Rome. But when one of Monty's reckless decisions turns the trip abroad into a harrowing manhunt that spans across Europe, it calls into question everything he knows, including his relationship with the boy he loves. So, I think I bet a lot of you heard that and you were like, yes, sign me up. Like, gotta love a good adventure book with loads and loads of romance in the middle. And uh, that is what it is at its core. I thought this was an excellent book. I only gave this one four stars because my main issue with it is that the plot isn't particularly great, to be honest. I didn't like the way it, I didn't like the way it flowed from one scene to the next, one area to the next. It had that kind of Indiana Jones feel where like um, you don't stay in one area long enough to appreciate the, in, the setting or the environment, even though it is described really well in the book, like the writing is really nice. And I do really enjoy the characters. I think it's the characters is what makes this book as good as it is, because the plot certainly didn't. It uh, did too much of the whole jumping around just for the sake of, oh, let's go somewhere else, let's go somewhere else, let's, oh, let's see all these new places. And uh, I wanted to focus more on the romance, which was, you know, tailed along throughout the book rather than just a huge chunk. 
So uh, yeah, that's kind of my problem with it. But I do highly recommend this, especially to all of those that want some LGBT. This is uh, one of the only ones I've ever read where it's set back in like the 1800s. So attitudes towards Monty are, you know, not the best. And also his best friend Percy is black. So there's also a lot of um, horrific attitudes towards Percy as well. So it also shows some really interesting uh, discrimination and the way people were treated back then. It makes you appreciate how lucky we are now, even if it still isn't great to this day. And yeah, highly recommend. So next is Turtles All The Way Down by John Green. So uh, this is what I can't wait to read a quote to because uh, there are so many. I might even read two for this one. So uh, this is one of, my, one of my favorite authors. I love John Green to death. The Fault in Our Stars is one of my favorite books of all time. Even if it is flawed, I still love it to death and I will always love it to death. Uh, this one I gave four and a half stars. So my main issue with this, I'm gonna tell you right now before I even read the blurb, is again, the plot. <laughs> that comes up quite a lot in some of these because sometimes they place so much emphasis on characters or something else in the story that um, they forget to write a really cohesive and well done plot. But um, the main overarching plot in this, which will be described in the blurb, is really bare bones. There's not a lot there. You can, you can predict what's gonna happen from like the first like 10 pages. It's not even really a plot twist, nothing like that. And, um, and it kind of bugged me because that was what the whole end of the book was centered on. So then I was just kind of like, oh, you know, it was so amazing for like the first three, th three quarters. And then you were just like, really good bit with the characters and then boring plot done. And I was just kind of like, oh, why? It would have been five stars. Could have been one of the best books I've ever read. You know what I mean? The best representation of mental illness, however, I have ever read. Because um, one of the, the main characters in this suffers with anxiety, OCD. And um, as someone who does suffer with anxiety, this hits hard. It has been a long time since I read it, though. So I think if I reread it now, when I have a lot more grasp on how I'm feeling, because when I read this, I was still unsure whether I was suffering with anxiety or not. I think it would hit me harder these days. So I'm definitely gonna do that and uh, let you all know. Perhaps we'll have a real talk. I might even get emotional, who knows? So let's find you a quote. Oh, actually first, let's read you the blurb. I should probably do that, shouldn't I? 16 year old Aza never intended to pursue the mystery of fugitive billionaire Russell Pickett, but here's a $100,000 reward at stake and her best and most fearless friend Daisy is eager to investigate. So together they navigate the short distance and broad divides that separate them from Russell Pickett's son. Aza is trying. She is trying to be a good daughter, a good friend, a good student, and maybe even a good detective, while also living within the ever-tightening spiral of her own thoughts. So it makes it sound like that whole investigative thing is the main focus of the story. It's not. It's the spiraling thoughts that she's having and the anxiety, the OCD. That's what's most exciting about this. So let's find you a quote. Quote number one. Davis and I never talked much or even looked at each other, but it didn't matter because we were looking at the same sky together, which is maybe more intimate than eye contact anyway. Anyone can look at you. It's quite rare to find someone who sees the same world you see. Quote number two. The worst part of being truly alone is you think about all the times you wish that everyone would just leave you be. Then they do, and you were left being, and you turn out to be terrible company. Oh, I feel this one on a spiritual level. Quote three. I tried not to think the thought, but like a dog on a leash, I could only get so far from it before I felt the strangling pull against my throat. My stomach rumbled. So there's just a couple of quotes on this book. There's plenty more I could have read. There's some uh, amazing, amazing content in this, so I definitely highly recommend this one. Obviously, trigger warnings for all the mental illnesses above. If it's going to really hurt you or if it's going to take you to a dark place, I don't recommend it because I've seen some reviews where people definitely have been taken to places like that because of how intense this gets. But other than that, I do recommend it. And last but not least is the book I said in the last video. I forgot to really say that this was the best book of all the ones I'd read. This is one of my favorite books of all time. Like, I like this more than Eleanor Oliver, and this one is amazing. The Book Thief is the only one I think is better. And that is We Are the Ants by Sean David Hutchinson. Now, uh, I'd watched a lot of reviews and a lot of the booktubers I watched, and a lot of them read this and said, oh, this is one of my new favorite books of all time. This was my best book of the year, that kind of thing. And as soon as I heard the, the blurb description, I was like, yep, I know I'm going to love that. And guess what? I did. I absolutely loved it. But for those who think the title is a little bit weird, I'll read the blurb to you. There are a few things Henry Denton knows and a few things he doesn't. Henry knows that his mother is struggling to keep the family together and coping by chain-smoking cigarettes. He knows that his older brother is a college dropout with a pregnant girlfriend. He knows that he is slowly losing his grandmother to Alzheimer's and he knows that his boyfriend committed suicide last year. Heavy. 
What Henry doesn't know is why the aliens choose to abduct him when he was 13, and he doesn't know why they continue to steal him from his bed and take him aboard their ship. He doesn't know why the world is going to end, or why the aliens have offered him the opportunity to avert the impending disaster by pressing a big red button. But they have, and they've only given him 144 days to make up his mind. The question is whether Henry thinks the world is worth saving, that is, until he meets Diego Vega, an artist with a secret past who forces Henry to question his beliefs, his place in the universe, and whether any of it really matters at all. But before Henry can save the world, he's got to figure out how to save himself, and the aliens haven't given him a button for that. That's such a good blurb for this. That is actually really, really good. So if you're a little bit daunted thinking, oh, you know, sci-fi, the sci-fi is extremely, extremely minimal. It's just a plot device, if anything. Like, do, does he does he think the world is worth saving? That's all it's really there for. Like, um, it's very minimal, that whole element of it. It's way more about uh, grief. That is the main, most incredible thing in this book, is the way grief is uh, portrayed. I've never quite seen anything so real, so in depth, and um, it, she is, it paints the perfect picture. And it also, there is some also good uh, mental health rep in this as well, like asking for help, knowing there's something wrong, saying to people that there's something wrong, and um, how it manifests itself in the way you behave, like you don't care how others treat you, like it's, there's just so much going on. and. Uh, I'm not going to go too in-depth about it, but there is a couple of quotes I'm going to read to you all, of course. Quote number one. I pick up my phone to text Jesse before I remember he's dead, and the wound tears open, bloody and raw, all over again. A person can become a part of you as real as your arm or leg, and even though Jesse is dead, I still feel the weight of that phantom limb. I have a thousand amazing memories of him, but his suicide is leaking into those recollections, poisoning our past. I can hardly remember him without hating him for taking his life and leaving me alone in mine. Quote number two, life isn't fair. That's what we tell kids when they're young and learn that there are no rules, or rather that they are, but only suckers play by them. We don't reassure them or give them tools to help them cope with the reality of life. We simply pat them on the back and send them on their way, burdened with the knowledge that nothing they do will ever really matter. It can't if life's not fair. Third quote, this is towards the end of the book, so skip this if you actually want to read the book, even though it isn't a spoiler, but still. Mrs. Franklin, that's Jessie's mum. She sighed. Yes, Henry, if you knew the world was going to end, but you had the power to stop it, would you? Yes. Why? Mrs. Franklin's back was to me, but I imagined I could see the determined set of her jaw, the same resolute expression I'd seen on Jessie's face a hundred times, because Jessie believed that life wasn't worth living, and I refused to prove him right. And I think we'll end it on that note. So yeah, I realise now quite a lot of these books were really sad, weren't they? But I do love a really hard-hitting sad, heavy, contemporary. That's my thing. I do like to try all different things out. Please, guys, if you have recommendations for me, list them in the comments. Um, any of these sort of genres, I'll try anything once. And um, I really, really hope you guys enjoyed this. Please like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell to be notified for all of our future videos. There's plenty more on the way. I'm thinking about doing a uh, makeup look to go with my red hair. Red? Uh, pink. I don't even know. I'm, all of a sudden, I just don't know what colors are. Well, well, we're doing a pink makeup look to go with the pink hair and it's going to be an all pink extravaganza. So look forward to that, especially if you uh, watch all my videos. And thank you so much. Would you like to say to our mother? Bye. Bye, guys. Love you. Enjoy your evening.